Welcome back, my friends. Welcome back to the continuation of the Corbett Report podcast. I am your host, James Corbett, podcasting to you as always from the sunny climes of Western Japan on this 17th day of January, 2010. Of course, I'd like to warmly welcome back all of the listeners to the Corbett Report podcast and remind them all, as always, to check into the websites CorbettReport.com, AlqaedaDoesn'tExist.com, ClimateGate.tv, and ReportageBook.com. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all of the affiliates and other groups that help to broadcast and otherwise syndicate this podcast, including RadioForAll.net, CascadiaPublicRadio.org, and ZeroPointRadio.com. And as always, if you ever have any problems downloading any of the episodes from the Corbett Report homepage, please go to archive.org and search for Corbett Report to find episodes going back all the way to episode 70 independently hosted on their servers. I hope everyone enjoyed their New Year's break, and I know that I certainly did, but now I'm back and ready to begin work on the website in earnest once again, and especially I have a number of interviews coming up in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned to the Interviews tab of CorbettReport.com, or subscribe to our interview RSS feed to get all of them delivered directly to your MP3 player of choice as they become available. And now, without further ado, let's get to today's real news. Today's first real news story comes from the New York Times, January 13th, 2010. Meet Mikey, 8. U.S. has him on watch list. The Transportation Security Administration, under scrutiny after last month's bombing attempt, has on its website a mythbuster that tries to reassure the public. Myth. The no-fly list includes an 8-year-old boy. Buster. No eight-year-old is on a TSA watch list. Meet Mikey Hicks, said Najla Feeney Hicks, introducing her eight-year-old son, a New Jersey Cub Scout and frequent traveler who has seldom boarded a plane without a hassle because he shares the name of a suspicious person. It's not a myth. Michael Winston Hicks's mother initially sensed trouble when he was a baby, and she could not get a seat for him on their flight to Florida at an airport kiosk. Airline officials explained that his name was on the list, she recalled. The first time he was patted down at Newark Liberty International Airport, Mikey was two. He cried. After years of long delays and waits for supervisors at every airport ticket counter, This year's vacation to the Bahamas badly shook up the family. Mikey was frisked on the way there, then more aggressively on the way home. Up your arms, down your arms, up your crotch. Someone is patting your eight-year-old down like he's a criminal, Mrs. Hicks recounted. A terrorist can blow his underwear up and they don't catch him. But my eight-year-old can't walk through security without being frisked. Today's second real news story comes from Times Online, January 8, 2010. Secretive food firms risk public backlash, Lords warn. The secretive attitude of food companies towards nanotechnology research risks starting a consumer backlash against products that could improve health and reduce waste, a parliamentary inquiry has found. Nanomaterials that are 800 times finer than a human hair have the potential to deliver foods that are very low in fat and salt and packaging that changes color when food is spoiled because of the strange properties of molecules at such a small scale. Their development, however, has also raised safety concerns because their effects on humans are poorly understood. These fears have inspired a culture of secrecy about nanotechnology in the food industry because it is worried about a repeat of the GM crop safety scare, according to a report from the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee. This lack of transparency could encourage exactly the sort of mistrust that companies hope to avoid. The committee also found significant gaps in scientific understanding of the toxicology of nanomaterials, which need to be addressed urgently with new research so that they can be regulated effectively. 
Our next real news story comes from the Huffington Post, 12th of January, 2010. Monsanto's GMO corn linked to organ failure, study reveals. In a study released by the International Journal of Biological Sciences, analyzing the effects of genetically modified food on mammalian health, researchers found that agricultural giant Monsanto's GM corn is linked to organ damage in rats. According to the study, three varieties of Monsanto's GM corn, Mon863, incesticide-producing Mon810, and Roundup herbicide-absorbing NK603 were approved for consump- consumption by U.S., European, and several other national food safety authorities. Monsanto gathered its own crude statistical data after conducting a 90-day study, even though chronic problems can rarely be found after 90 days, and concluded that the corn was safe for consumption. The stamp of approval may have been premature, however. In the conclusion of the IJBS study, researchers wrote, Effects were mostly concentrated in kidney and liver functions, the two major diet detoxification organs, but in detail differed with each GM type. In addition, some effects on heart, adrenal, spleen, and blood cells were also frequently noted, as there normally exists sex differences in liver and kidney metabolism, the highly statistically significant disturbances in the functions of these organs seen between male and female rats cannot be dismissed as biologically insignificant, as has been proposed by others. We therefore conclude that our data strongly suggests that these GM maize varieties induce a state of hepatorenal toxicity, These substances have never before been an integral part of the human or animal diet, and therefore their health consequences for those who consume them, especially over long time periods, are currently unknown. Today's next real news story comes from foxnews.com, January 15th, 2010. UN's World Health Organization eyeing global tax on banking internet activity. The World Health Organization is considering a plan to ask governments to impose a global consumer tax on such things as internet activity or everyday financial transactions like paying bills online. Such a scheme could raise tens of billions of dollars on behalf of the United Nations public health arm from a broad base of consumers, which would then be used to transfer drug-making research development and manufacturing capabilities among other things, to the developing world. Today's next real news story comes from the Daily Mail, 11th of January 2010. The false pandemic. Drug firms cashed in on scare over swine flu, claims Euro Health Chief. The swine flu outbreak was a false pandemic, driven by drug companies that stood to make billions of pounds from a worldwide scare, a leading health expert has claimed. Wolfgang Wodarg, head of health at the Council of Europe, accused the makers of flu drugs and vaccines of influencing the World Health Organization's decision to declare a pandemic. This led to the pharmaceutical firms ensuring enormous gains, while countries, including the UK, squandered their meager health budgets, with millions being vaccinated against a relatively mild disease. A resolution proposed by Dr. Wodarg calling for an investigation into the role of drug firms has been passed by the Council of Europe, the Strasbourg-based Senate responsible for the European Court of Human Rights. An emergency debate on the issue will be held later this month. Welcome to episode 113 of the Corbett Report. Meet George Soros. Longtime listeners of this podcast might remember from episode 52 that I did touch on George Soros as a billionaire financier and a master string puller. And at the end of episode 52, I did point out that in fact, yes, George Soros had also thrown out that gang sign New World Order, which listeners of this podcast will know by now, really is something of a gang sign for a group of intergenerational serial killers who are working towards the great work of instituting totalitarian 
one world government for the purposes of enriching themselves, keeping all of the wealth, power, and new advanced technologies to themselves, enslaving what is left of humanity, and culling the population of the world in the exoteric sense for saving the world from global warming, and in the esoteric sense more for the purpose of furthering their religion of eugenics, which of course only feeds into their own sense of their own worth. Now, for some people out there, of course that will seem like quite a stretch and quite a leap of logic, and it was a point at which episode 52 ended where I asked people to continue the research for themselves. So why don't we pick up from that point? Yes, we know that George Soros did indeed write a a book called Toward a New World Order, in which he argued essentially that NATO should become the world's police force until such time as the UN can become the world's government. But does that really mean that he's actually part of the true power structure that governs behind the scenes? Are there any other things that would implicate him in this? Because of course, New World Order may be a gang sign of sorts, but just as someone might accidentally wear Crip Blue in a blood part of town, so someone might accidentally stumble upon the one of the key gang word phrases of this group of intergenerational serial killers. So maybe we should begin taking a look at George Soros in particular and see if there's anything to this. Is he one of the string pullers? And if so, how can we find that out? Well, of course, one logical place to go would be Soros.org, which is the website of the Open Society Institute and Soros Foundations Network. The Open Society Institute being, of course, a philanthropic organization for promoting democracy in such places as Eastern Europe, and we'll dismantle that a little bit later on. But for now, let's just take a look at Soros.org in the About OSI section. Uh, looking at the biographies of founder and chairman George Soros, which reads in part, quote, Soros was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1930. His father was taken prisoner during World War I and eventually fled from captivity in Russia to reunite with his family in Budapest. Soros was 13 years old when Hitler's Wehrmacht seized Hungary and began deporting the country's Jews to extermination camps. In 1946, as the Soviet Union was taking control of the country, Soros attended a conference in the West and defected. He emigrated in 1947 to England, supported himself by working as a railroad porter and a restaurant waiter, graduated in 1952 from the London School of Economics, and obtained an entry-level position with an investment bank. In 1956, Soros emigrated to the United States, He worked as a trader and analyst until 1963. In 1967, he helped establish an offshore investment fund, and in 1973, he set up a private investment firm that eventually evolved into the Quantum Fund, one of the first hedge funds, through which he accumulated a vast fortune. As his financial success mounted, Soros applied his wealth to help foster the development of open societies. In 1979, Soros provided funds to help black students attend the University of Cape Town in apartheid South Africa. Soon he created a foundation in Hungary to support culture and education and the country's transition to democracy. One of his projects imported photocopy machines that allowed citizens and activists in Hungary to spread information and publish censored materials. Soros also distributed funds to the Underground Solidarity Movement in Poland, Chapter 77 in Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet physicist dissident Andrei Sakharov. In 1982, Soros named his philanthropic organization the Open Society Fund, in honor of Karl Popper, and began granting scholarships to students from Eastern Europe. Bolstered by the success of these projects, Soros created more programs to assist the free flow of information. He supported educational radio programs in Mongolia, and later contributed $100 million to provide internet access to every regional university in Russia. End quote. Now that's just a sampling, a snippet of Soros' biography, but suffice it to say he is a multi, multi, multi multi-billionaire who has invested vast sums of his fortune into very many projects around the world seeking to influence political events. Now, that much is certain and without dispute, but 
The point in question is really to what extent does he actively participate in the construction of the New World Order as we have come to know it in this podcast. Well, let's take a look at some of his ideas specifically and from his own mouth. So, for example, when examining whether someone really is an advocate for the New World Order in the gang sense, well, let's take a look. So does George Soros, for example, define this New World Order as a one-world financial system which will necessarily see the erosion of national sovereignty? What sort of a financial deal should Obama be seeking to strike when he travels to China next month? No, I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, um, uh, world order, financial world order. Uh, They are kind of reluctant members of the IMF. They play along, but they don't make much of a contribution because it's not their uh, uh, not their institution. Their share is, is not commensurate. Their voting rights are not commensurate to their weight. So I think you need a, a new world order that China has to be part of the process of creating it. And they have to buy in. They have to own it the same way as, let's say, the United States owns the Washington consensus, the current order. And, and I think this would be a more stable one where, where uh, uh, you would have a coordinated uh, policies. I think the makings of it are already there because the G20, in agreeing to peer reviews, effectively is moving in that direction. Okay, New World Financial Order, Institution of One World System. Yes, okay, check. Well, how about the oft-spouted idea that the New World Order consists of taking advantage of crises and seeing them as opportunities, crisitunities, if one will? Does Soros adhere to that particular New World Order idea? Well, let's turn to the mail online from March 25th, 2009, by way of Infowars.com. Soros, I'm having a very good crisis. Quote, a hedge fund manager who predicted the global credit crunch has said the financial crisis has been stimulating and the culmination of his life's work. George Soros, who predicted the global financial crisis twice before, was one of the few people to anticipate and prepare for the current economic collapse. Mr. Soros said his prediction meant he was better able to brace his quantum investment fund against the global storm. But other investors failed to take notice of his prediction, and his decision to come out of retirement in 2007 to manage the fund made him $2.9 billion. And while the financial crisis continued to deepen across the globe, the 78-year-old still managed to make $1.1 billion last year. It is, in a way, the culminating point of my life's work, he told national newspaper The Australian. End quote. Now, I quote from the Infowars.com preserved version of that article, because if you go to the Mail Online, you will find that article is no longer online. Why is that? Well, an update uh, came on 8th of June 2009, which reads... Quote, an article published on 25th of March 2009 suggested that George Soros had said that he was having a very good crisis in respect of the recession. Mr. Soros has asked us to make clear that in fact he made no such comment. End quote. Well, there you go, straight from the horse's mouth. It was just some vicious rumor made up by some male online reporter. And although you can go and watch YouTube interviews uh, made by various news organizations that even quote that quote back to him in the interview, which he acknowledges and does not dispute at that time, but apparently it was completely made up. All right, well, fair enough. Can we on our own find any clips where he does see the crisis of the meltdown in the world financial system as an opportunity to bring in a new financial order? Some have said the following, you know, the Chinese were worried about an overheated economy and it took an American recession to do it. Right, right. That's correct. 
It's, 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 it's okay. right. So we have this global economic order. Right. Uh, where does that put us? And what is the new reality for America as an economic power? It is, it is in, in, impairing that power. Uh, eroding uh, it? Eroding it. Uh, you know, I wrote another book, The Bubble of American Supremacy, right, right. where I use this financial analysis of, uh, analogy of bu bubbles to, Amer to uh, 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 President Bush's pursuit of American supremacy. Right. Uh, and I said it's going to bust. And it, it has actually done tremendous damage to America's political and military power and influence in the world. So that we, uh, we have suffered a big setback. Now we have a sort of a, a bit of the equivalent of that happening in the financial sphere. That is really what is happening. So the unquestioned dominance of the dollar is now questioned. And this creates a, a period of turmoil, just as politically you have turmoil because the world order, the political world order, comes back to your original mm -hmm. question, the political world order was built on America as the dominant power. And mm -hmm. then America failed in performing the role that is, was called upon, right. and that created a lot of uncertainty and, and turmoil in the world. And now the same thing is happening in the financial right. sphere. Okay, Christatunity, check. And extra points for anyone out there who noticed that that was Bilderberger Charlie Rose interviewing Bilderberger George Soros. And even more extra points for anyone who can guess what Charlie Rose's opening question for George Soros was in that April 2008 edition of The Charlie Rose Show. A breakdown in the prevailing world order. Tell me how you see that. Ah, uh, Bilderberger, Charlie Rose. <sighs> <clears throat> Moving right along. Well... We've checked that, in fact, George Soros, the multi-billionaire investor and financier, has, in fact, been advocating a new world financial order of one world financial system, ruled by one world bureaucracy, headed, for example, by the IMF, having a peer review process where the IMF can determine the financial actions of any individual member state. Well, then, how about the globalists' favorite tool of man-made global warming as the scare through which they can enact a fundamental transformation of the world economy and world political structures? Is George Soros in on that? So let's think about those people down at Neely's Barbecue going home tonight having heard you. What they've heard you say is the system is really dysfunctioning right now. It's out of control. Nobody's in charge. Hmm. They've heard you express your own worry that in the next three months it could get much, much worse. And they've heard you say that you don't see much good news immediately on the horizon. So let's leave them something to think about as they go home. Let them go home and say, Mr. Soros said, here are three things we can do, simply. One, well, deal with the, mor with the mortgage problem, reduce uh, uh, foreclosures, uh, recapitalize uh, the banks and uh, and then work on a better world order where we work together to de resolve problems that confront humanity like global warming and I think I think that uh, dealing with global warming will require a lot of investment you see for the last 25 years the world economy the motor of the world economy that has been driving it was consumption by the American consumer who has been spending more than he has been saving, all right, uh, uh, than he has been producing. So that motor is now switched off. It's finished. It's run out of, uh, uh, can't continue. You need a new motor. And we have a big problem, global warming requires big investment and that could be the motor of, of, of the world economy in the years to come. Putting more and money then, in, building infrastructure, converting to green in, technology. In, instead of consuming, 
building an electricity grid, saving on energy, or rewiring the houses, adjusting your lifestyle, where energy has got to cost more until it, you introduce those new things. So it will be painful, but at least we will survive and not cook. <laughs> You're talking about this being the end of an era and needing to create a whole new paradigm for the economic model of the country, of the world, right? Yes. Well, okay, new world order of punishing austerity where energy is absorbently expensive so that everyone has to be forced into rationing and there is an eventual call-off of the population. Yes, check. And extra points go there, not only to the people who pointed out that that was Bilderberg Bill Moyers interviewing Bilderberg George Soros, but that Bill Moyers is in fact a trustee of George Soros's Open Society Institute's Board of Directors. Now, that might seem like an offhand criticism of the, shall we say, cozy relationship between people like Moyers and Soros, or Soros and Rose, but in fact it actually goes quite to the heart of the matter in a number of ways, not only insofar as the fact that my favorite catchphrase of corporate controlled media does in fact completely fail in the sense that it fails to deliver any understanding of the fact that the foundation funded media such as PBS or moveon.org or current.com or any of those types of media platforms alternate are also, of course, very much corrupt and not to be trusted. But also, it shows that there is a left-right-wing split within the New World Order itself that represents not a fundamental difference in ultimate ideology. Of course, both groups are vying for the same thing, but they are vying for different ways and different routes to get there. And to a certain extent, it's part of the dialectical process, which we've looked at in the problem-reaction-solution episode of this podcast, which is designed to eventually bring us to the pre-decided spot of totalitarian world government. You can either take the left way to get there or the right way to get there, but it's the same thing. Now, Soros would be perhaps the left-wing billionaire financier puppet master and string puller, whereas Warren Buffett would be the right-wing version of that, and people might remember where Warren Buffett was on 9-11. But uh, ultimately, although they have competing ideas on such things as advocating the legalization of marijuana or the war on terror and the way in which that should be waged, they will, of course, perfectly agree on such things as 9-11 and how al Qaeda pulled it off single-handedly. So, ultimately, it's going to lead us to the same direction. But we've taken a look at the official biography of George Soros, and that begs the question, well, if that's the clean, safe, sanitized version of his history... What is it that we're not finding out about George Soros' history? Well, let's turn to Bob Chapman, a frequent guest on this program, for some information on that. And this comes from the May 15th, 2009 edition of The Alex Jones Show. Incidentally, I'd like to interject that uh, George Soros was convicted of market rigging in France in appeal to the highest court and lost. So he's a convicted felon who paid a fine. And then he was just recently uh, nabbed in Hungary for the same thing, and he had to pay a large fine there. So the guy is a crook. So all of you people who didn't know, George Soros is a crook. But, but why is he so arrogant? I mean, he's a smart criminal who funds the big liberal websites that attack me every day now, but and he literally funded Obama. But why would he tell a press conference? I mean, it was literally in scores of papers a month ago, as you know, Bob. I'm having the best time of my life. This is the culmination of my life. You know, I've basically engineered this, which is him bragging. He's only one part of a gaggle, you know, that did that. Why would the little bastard brag that he's causing all this pain? I guess it's just... Well, he, he's bragging for his whole group because he's an integral part of it. And as you know, he got his start by uh, deceiving Jewish people in the country in which he was born while working for the Gestapo so that they could confiscate the goods of Jews, he being Jewish himself. Did you know that? 
Uh, I knew that he was Jewish, and then he he was connected to some of the thuggery. Yes, it's kind of oh, like Madoff. He's a bad, bad person. But anyway, the arrogance. Well, no, no, hold on. Tell us more about that, that because uh, hold on, hold on. I, I mean, I vaguely knew about that, but uh, refresh me fully about him. I mean, I knew Madeline Albright's dad was a commissariat who killed over a million. That's mainline information and all the stolen arts in her house of people they robbed, including Jews, but also other people. Uh, I know that most people. Uh, John Chalikashvili's dad was the top Nazi in Poland, helping do. I mean, I know uh, same thing with you know all of these people. Same thing was the big Brzezinski. But uh, you're saying that uh, that Soros. Uh, tell us about that. Well, Soros very simply was uh, uh, probably twelve, fourteen years old at the time, and the Germans had invaded, and the Germans were rounding up Jews uh, to send them to internment camps and slave labor camps and extermination camps or whatever and his job because he was taken on with the gestapo i uh, i assume he told him that he wasn't jewish and stay there let's hear about it when we get back got a break bob uh, go ahead and finish up with that story bob chapman very despicable because what he did was go to jewish families and tell them look i'm jewish and and uh you know i'll, I'll help you hide your stuff and get you out of the country and that sort of thing and uh, he found out where their wealth was, and, you know, the next day they marched in with the Gestapo and took their wealth and then, you know, put them on a train and sent them someplace. And so, you know, this is the worst of the worst. It's just like Madoff and what he did to all the Jewish charities and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than that as a human being. And I just want to let people know uh, this arrogant, connected uh, member of the the Illuminati, where he's coming from. And it, it's not a very uh, illustrious history, that's for sure. Sickening, appalling, perhaps even shocking, but nonetheless quite true. And in order to document and back up some of the things that they were talking about in that clip, let's turn to some documentation. First of all, from SorosMonitor.com, we have a posting from the 26th of September 2006 regarding an interview that George Soros gave to 60 Minutes back in 1998, in which he discussed, well, one of the more surprising aspects of what he was doing in the Holocaust and what he felt about his role. And uh, I'll read verbatim from the transcript, which is provided on SorosMonitor.com, but of course, for the documentation, in fact, all of the documentation listed in today's episode, of course, please go to CorbettReport.com, click on the Episodes tab, find today's episode, and click on the Documentation link, and you'll find a list of all of the documents cited in today's episode organized by Time Index. But reading from that transcript from the 1998 60 Minutes interview with George Soros, uh, Steve Croft, the interviewer, starts by asking, quote, You're a Hungarian Jew, Mr. Soros. Mm hmm. Croft, who escaped the Holocaust. Mr. Soros. Mm hmm. Croft, by, by posing as a Christian. Mr. Soros. Right. Croft, and you watched lots of people get shift, shipped off to the death camps. Soros. Right. I was 14 years old, and I would say that's when my character was made. Croft, in what way? Soros, that one should think ahead, one should understand and, and anticipate events, and when, when one is threatened. It was a tremendous amount of evil. I mean, it was a, a very personal experience of evil. Croft, my understanding is that you went out with this protector of yours, who swore that you were his adopted godson. Soros, yes, yes. Croft, went out, in fact, and helped in the confiscation of property from the Jews. Soros. Yes, that's right, yes. Croft. I mean, that's... That sounds like an experience that would send lots of people to the psychiatric couch for many, many years. Was it difficult? Soros. Not... Not at all. Not at all. Maybe as a child you don't... You don't see the connection. But it was... It created no... No problem at all. Croft. No feeling of guilt? Soros. No. Croft. For example, that I'm Jewish, and here I am watching these people go. I could just as easily be there. I should be there. None of that? Soros. 
Well, of course, I could... I could be on the other side, or I could be the one from whom the thing is being taken away, but there was no sense that I shouldn't be there, because that was, well, actually, in a funny way, it's just like in markets, that if I weren't there, of course, I wasn't doing it, but somebody else would, would would be taking it away anyhow. And it was the, whether I was there or not, I was only a spectator. The property was being taken away. So the, I had no role in taking away that property. So I had no sense of guilt. End quote. From an undated article on Bloomberg.com, the following, Soros, French insider trading conviction, upheld. Quote, Billionaire investor George Soros was found guilty of insider trading by a French appeals court upholding a 2002 conviction in a case that he's been fighting for 16 years. The Paris appeals court ruled that Soros's 1988 purchase of Société Générale S.A. shares with the knowledge that the bank might be a takeover target broke French insider trading laws. The court today confirmed an earlier order asking Soros to pay back his 2.2 million euros in gains. Prosecutors didn't ask for punitive damages, and Soros faces no other penalties or restrictions in France. The verdict marks the only legal strain on Soros's 40-year investing career. End quote. From CBS News, August 29, 2007, Soros-linked group hit with huge fine. Quote, the Federal Election Commission has fined one of the last cycle's biggest liberal political action committees $775,000 for using unregulated soft money to boost John Kerry and other Democratic candidates during the 2004 elections. America Coming Together Act raised $137 million for its get-out-the-vote effort in 2004, but the FEC found most of that cash came through contributions that violated federal limits. The group's big donors included George Soros, Progressive Corp Chairman Peter Lewis, and the Service Employees International Union. End quote. We have this story from the 27th of September 2007. Soros supports checkbook science and astroturf immigration rallies. Quote, How many people, for instance, know that James Hansen, a man billed as a lonely NASA whistleblower standing up to the mighty U.S. government, was really funded by Soros's Open Society Institute, which gave him legal and media advice. That's right, Hansen was packaged for the media by Soros's flagship philanthropy by as much as $720,000, most likely under the OSI's politici- politicization of science program. That may have meant that Hansen had media flax help him get on the evening news to push his agenda, and lawyers pressuring officials to let him spout his supposedly censored spiel for weeks in the name of advancing the global warming agenda. Hansen even succeeded, with public pressure from his nightly news performances, in forcing NASA to change its media policies to his advantage. Had Hansen's OSI funding been known, the public might have viewed the whole production differently. The outcome could have been different. End quote. And we have this story from the Budapest Times, 30th of March, 2009. Soros sorry over decimation of OTP's share price. Quote, the State Financial Supervisory Authority imposed a record 1.6 million euro fine on the New York-based Soros Fund Management last week for breaking rules on influencing the market while trading on the Budapest Stock Exchange. In a statement to state news agency MTI, Hungarian-born billionaire financier George Soros said he was sincerely sorry about the share deal that led to the penalty. Soros Fund Management made a last-minute bulk sale of stock in the Hungarian bank OTP on 9th of October. The State Financial Supervisory Authority said the transaction led to the price of OTP stock plummeting by over 14%. The case is especially upsetting to me because of my close personal attachment to Hungary, Soros said in his statement, promising that his firm would cooperate to the full with the Hungarian authorities. I would like to stress that I no longer oversee the running of Soros Fund Management. I withdrew last year and now only direct deals on my own account. End quote. For anyone who does not yet get the general idea of 
where Mr. Soros is coming from and what type of psychology he might correspond to, you might be advised to check out episode 90 of this podcast, Our Leaders Are Psychopaths. But this brings us to the question, what is George Soros and his Open Society Institute up to these days? The Bush administration in May of 2007 uh, they signed an order uh, instructing the CIA to destabilize the Iranian regime. This is, I, I give all kinds of sites to this information in my columns. It's not disputed. It was reported on uh, ABC television. It was reported by the famous investigative reporter Seymour Hersh in the New Yorker. It was reported in the London Telegraph. Uh, it's just known, period. I mean, it's, it's not disputed. In fact, the government's proud of it that we, that we, um, and, and we even know the sum. The initial sum appropriated was four hundred million dollars to uh, purchase protest and and destabilization and to fund the various uh, Iranian splinter terrorist groups. There are a lot of, not a lot, but there are other uh, ethnic uh, groups within Iran opposed to the two main groups, and, and uh, there are terrorist groups associated with those, and, and they are funded with uh, U.S. government money. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, which includes, of course, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is our main uh, funding mechanism for interfering in foreign in foreign elections. We used it in Serbia, we used it in Georgia and Ukraine, we used it in the uh, former Soviet uh, Central Asian Republics, though not without much, uh, not, not with much uh, success there, but with success in Georgia and Ukraine where we managed to get uh, puppet governments in, in place. So all of that comes together in these protests and um, <clears throat> that's uh, that's why um, uh, they happen. That was Paul Craig Roberts, the former assistant secretary of the U.S. Treasury and the ex-associate editor of the Wall Street Journal, who joined the Corbett Report back in June of last year, 2009, to talk about the Iran elections and the uprising, the spontaneous people's uprising that took place under the green color during last year's Iranian elections. But, of course, there is the Soros connection to think about when it comes to that spontaneous uprising. And that's something that I covered in an article that got spread quite widely at the time under the headline, Destabilization 2.0, Soros, the CIA, Mossad, and the New Media Destabilization of Iran which talks about the so-called Twitter revolution of Moldova and the one that was attempted in Iran, both of which failed. But uh, also the fact that Soros was very much one of the people behind that. And quoting from that article, we have, quote, Destabilization 1.2 involves seemingly disinterested democracy-promoting NGOs with feel-good names like the Open Society Institute, Freedom House, and the National Endowment for Democracy. They fund, train, support, and mobilize opposition movements in countries that have been targeted for destabilization, often during elections, and usually organized around an identifiable color. These color revolutions sprang up in the past decade and have so far successfully destabilized the governments of the Ukraine, Lebanon, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan, among others. These revolutions bear the imprint of billionaire finance oligarch George Soros. The hidden hand of Western powers behind these color revolutions has threatened their effectiveness in recent years, however, with an anti-Soros movement having arisen in Georgia, and with the recent Moldovan grape revolution having come to naught, much to the chagrin of Soros-funded OSI's Evgeny Morozov. End quote. 
For a more in-depth analysis, including more information about exactly how Soros is connected to these groups, I would, of course, once again recommend people hit up William Engdahl at engdahl.oilgeopolitics.net, who in August of 2008 had an excellent summary of Georgia and the Rose Revolution, which took place there, that installed the uh, U.S. NATO establishment puppet Saakashvili back in 2003, and that also had the imprints of Soros all over it, and Soros's foundations, including the Open Society Institute, which of course is nothing but benevolent and only wants to install serviceable henchmen for the oligarchs, I mean, country after country, and is uh, more or less succeeding, although the recent failures in Moldova and Iran must have been a blow to the effectiveness of that technique. And even Soros's henchman, Evgeny Morozov, who is who was the biggest cheerleader for these so-called Twitter revolutions and the like, has taken recently to talking about how ineffectual these internet techniques are, because of course they can also be used by the dictatorships that these wonderful spontaneous people's uprisings are opposing. But uh, as that Destabilization 2.0 article noted, not only is there an anti-Soros movement arising in Georgia, there's also one in the Ukraine. And you can hit up BBC News from the 31st of March 2004 for an article, Soros Gets Splattered in Ukraine. Quote, The billionaire philanthropist George Soros get, got a wet reception in Ukraine when two young men threw water and mayonnaise at him. The incident happened at a human rights conference in the capital, Kiev. The two men were immediately arrested by the police. The radical nationalist group Bratstvo, Brotherhood, claimed responsibility for the attack. The group accused Mr. Soros of trying to repeat in Ukraine the Georgia-type Velvet Revolution of last November. Some critics have suggested that Mr. Soros's Open Society Institute played a role in the ouster of Georgian President Edward she Shevardnadze, who was forced to resign amid mass public protests. But Mr. Soros denied such claims. Everything in Georgia was done by its people, not by me. I had nothing to do with it. End quote. Well, I'm not exactly sure of the significance of the water and mayonnaise, but at the very least, it certainly puts an oligarch like that in his place. One can only take heart in the fact that at least the people were able to identify and name the puppet master of the so-called Orange Revolution almost nine months before it even began. Because, yes, that's right, although that article makes these protesters sound like weird conspiracy theorists, of course, it's very much true that nine months later, a velvet revolution happened again in Ukraine, but this time under the name of the Orange Revolution. Oh, how original. And yes, they do run the same script in country after country until it starts to fail, at which time they will have to change their operation. Again, I'll let you follow the links from the documentation section of today's episode to find out more about those particular cases and how the color revolutions were funded by the Open Society Institute and George Soros's general level of participation in the, those revolutions. But as disturbing as all of that is, there is something much, much more disturbing with which George Soros is deeply involved. The price of admission is a billion dollars and a philanthropic heart, and that meets the pricey requirements recently held in a secret meeting, a private meeting in New York City. ABC's John Berman has the scoop on who was there and what was going on. Behind closed doors on this New York campus, a secret gathering of some of the world's most powerful people. Gates, Buffett, Bloomberg, Winfrey. It was like, well, it was like the Super Friends. In the great hall of the Justice League, there are assembled the world's four greatest heroes. Together with others at the meeting, including George Soros, Ted Turner, David Rockefeller, they're worth more than $125 billion. To have been in the room and, and see this meeting of the minds really would have been a fascinating thing. That much money, that much power around one table, it begs the question, what were they doing? What were they scheming? Total world domination? This group, together for six hours, was talking about charity, education, emergency relief, global health. 
all my friends are philanthropic, well, they probably wouldn't be my friends. An official at the Gates Foundation told ABCnews.com the overwhelming reason for the meeting was need. That was the issue that galvanized everyone to participate. Together, they've given away $70 billion since 1996. And with the sagging economy, their help could be just what struggling charities need. Charities are hurting, and somebody has to speak for all these charities. And if they want philanthropy to be robust in the future in the United States, these are the people where you really want to be talking about it. The new Superman and Wonder Woman, the super rich friends, not fighting bad guys, but fighting for good nonetheless. For Good Morning America, John Berman, ABC News, New York. Yes, apparently one of the things they discussed was what each of them knows about what really works and what doesn't work, so they can concentrate their resources. Well, if one can parse all of those layers of idiotic nonsense, drivel, distraction, and dumbing down least common denominator pop culture references, one could determine that that report from ABC News, if one can use such a noun to describe such a abomination of journalism was about a meeting that was held in New York in May of last year between some of the richest people on the planet, including, of course, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey, Ted Turner, Mayor Michael Bloomberg of New York, David Rockefeller, and George Soros, among others. And yes, they were meeting secretly to discuss how best to carry out philanthropic work. Oh, yes, that's why they needed their little secret behind closed doors meetings, right? Well, of course not, and I think all of my listeners who have been listening for any length of time will probably know what the meeting was really about, but why don't we document it anyway? From propagandamatrix.com, May 25th, 2009, secretive rich cabal met to discuss population control. Quote, our speculation that the secret billionaire club meeting at the beginning of the month was primarily focused around population control, a cause celeb embraced by David Rockefeller, Ted Turner, and Bill Gates, has been confirmed by a London Times report. Details of the secret confab were thin on the ground in the initial reports concerning the meeting of rich philanthropists like Rockefeller, Turner, Gates, Warren Buffett, and George Soros, which took place in New York on May 5th at the home of Sir Paul Nurse, a British Nobel Prize biochemist and president of the private Rockefeller University. An ABC News report about the confab offered little more than fawning idolatry towards the attendees, and was little more than a sophistic exercise in ass-kissing and creeping adulation for people like Rockefeller and Turner, who were portrayed as philanthropic saviors of the planet. We question this premise by pointing out that Turner has publicly advocated shocking population reduction programs that would cull human population by a staggering 95%. He has also called for a communist-style one-child policy to be mandated by governments in the West. In China, the, the one-child policy is enforced by means of taxes on each subsequent child, allied to an intimidation program which includes secret police and family planning authorities kidnapping pregnant, pregnant women from their homes and performing forced abortions. Of course, Turner completely fails to follow his own rules on how everyone else should live their lives, having five children and owning no less than two million acres of land. In the third world, Turner has contributed literally billions to population reduction, namely through United Nations programs, leading the way for the likes of Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett. Gates's father has long been a leading board member of Planned Parenthood and a top eugenicist. Our initial suspicions that the secret meeting was primarily concerned with population control has been confirmed by a London Times report, which states, Some of America's leading billionaires have met secretly to discuss how their wealth could be used to slow the growth of the world's population and speed up improvements in health and education. The philanthropists who attended a summit convened on the initiative of Bill Gates, the Microsoft co-founder, discussed joining forces to overcome political and religious obstacles to change. Of course, slowing the growth of the world's population, while also improving its health, are two irreconcilable concepts to the elite. Stabilizing world population is a natural byproduct of higher living standards, as has been proven by the stabilization of the white population in the West. 
elitists like David Rockefeller have no interest in slowing the growth of world population by natural methods. Their agenda is firmly rooted in the pseudoscience of eugenics, which is all about culling the surplus population via draconian methods. David Rockefeller's legacy is not derived from a well-meaning philanthropic urge to improve health in third world countries. It is born out of a Malthusian drive to eliminate the poor and those deemed racially inferior using the justification of social Darwinism. End quote. I suppose it's not such a long road after all for a 14-year-old boy who helped the Nazis confiscate property from his fellow Jews and then send them off to concentration camps to end up in secretive meetings discussing how best to cull the population with other elitists who think that their very genetic code somehow makes them better than you or I. But it is nonetheless shocking and disgusting. The question, as always, is what are you, what are we, going to do about it? Well, as always, I leave you here to begin the research on your own and to continue expanding your understanding of George Soros, one of the key financial oligarchs in this New World Order system. But if the thought of these elite financial manipulators meeting behind closed doors to discuss how best to kill you and your family is not motivation enough? Well, let's finish today with some motivating words by that great motivational speaker, George Soros. That's all for today. I am your host, James Corbett, thanking you for joining me this week and asking you to join me again next week for episode 114 of the Corbett Report podcast. New speak is double plus ungood. One of, the, one of the answers is that people don't care about the truth that much. Uh, I mean, people in America care about success, and it doesn't matter how you get there. So this, this pursuit of truth, which you know, has a long tradition, the Enlightenment and so on, is a, at the moment, I think, in, in trouble. <laughs>